Well, we're going to jump right into the message this morning. If, uh, if you're visiting with us, good morning and welcome. If you've been looking for a home church, man, you can stop looking. You can stop trolling other churches on Instagram and Facebook. You have found your new home church. We are, we're ready to have you get plugged in. We're so glad that you're here. Um, and if you've been with us for the last few weeks, you know that we've sort of been uh, in, a, in a series recapping the vision of our church. The vision of our church is to know God, grow strong, and do what he's called us to do, know, grow, do. So a month ago, we did to know God. We talked about knowing God personally. I think a lot of people in America, they know God intellectually. They know God, you know, they know church, they know Christianity, but they don't really, really know God personally. He hasn't had an, an amazing and profound impact in our hearts and lives. And then we moved on. We did two weeks on growing. So we, we did one week first on growing personally, that we would grow in our faith personally. We would grow in our understanding of the word personally. We would grow in our understanding of the character and nature of God personally. And then last week, in week three, we talked about growing corporately, that we as a church body, that, that we would, would grow uh, corporately, that we would go from being a common church to an uncommon church, that we would go from being a, a good church to a great church. And that's what God's calling. It's a process of maturing that, that we, as, as we go through this. So all of you, if you've been with us for the last you know, four weeks, you're a month older. Does, do, you, do you feel a month older? Do you, do you ever hate that when you were a kid on your birthday? How does it feel to be 10? It feels the same as nine in 364 days, but now I'm 10. We're a month older. We should be a month stronger in our faith. We should be a month more in love with Jesus. We should be deeper down the, the, into the deeper waters of God. We should love Jesus more today than we did a month ago. We, we should look like Jesus more today than we did a month ago. We've got so many new babies popping out left and right, mostly by pregnant women, but it's been, just, it's like we're just babies everywhere. And thank God they're small. I think we can take them because if they all grew full size, man, they'd overcome. They're just everywhere. There's babies everywhere. But all you new mamas, especially you first-time mamas, because you, you, it, it will slow down the picture-taking, I, I trust me, but it's a little out of control with your picture-taking right now. So um, it, in a one month, imagine how much your little one has changed. They couldn't roll over, now they can roll over. They didn't have teeth, now they have a little bump that you keep rubbing on the bottom. Leave it alone, they're drooling, but it'll come in this time. Maybe then now they can stand up and pull themselves up. Maybe they can do something they couldn't do before because they're growing. They're getting older. It's so neat to see they're maturing. But isn't a baby the most selfish thing in the whole wide world? Babies are so selfish. They don't contribute. They don't work. They don't do nothing. They just sleep and eat and poop and want you to change them and feed them and care for them. They don't pay taxes. They're just, they're just <laughs> selfish, selfish little babies. But as they grow, you know, as your children become older, they're in elementary school, they're in middle school, you, you teach them a chore, you know, my chore when I was a kid was taking out the trash and uh, mowing the yard. Those were my big chores. Um, and you know, depending on where you live, there's different chores, you know, whether it's doing dishes or helping out with the laundry or doing the vacuuming, we have chores as we get older. And then believe it or not, we grow up and we're adults and we get married and we make our own babies. And then it's like our whole life is to care for this other life. It's hashtag adulting. It's like, we, we, our whole job is now, it's like, I have to do grown-up stuff. I have to adult stuff. I have to go to work, or I have to go to school every day, or I have to pay taxes. It's, it's adulting. So let me ask you spiritually, make a mental list. How are you doing in your spiritual maturing process? How are you doing in your spiritual adulting with the grown-up Christian things? What are you doing for the Lord? We talked about knowing we talked about growing. Today, let's talk about what are we doing for the Lord? It's kind of like adulting. You remember the first time like you made your bed as an adult because you felt like it was a grown-up thing to do? And you were walking out of your room, and you looked over your shoulder, and you're like, I made my bed this morning. <laughs> now, in the old days, we used to just make our bed. Now, I know that you have to do a selfie Instagram over your shoulder, I made my bed, hashtag adulting, right? I get it. Or you didn't just put the dishes in the sink, you washed them. I got you, you ready? You take something out of the dresser drawer and then you close the dresser drawer. Okay, I got, okay, now I'm, now I'm talking your language. That's adulting. Closing your dresser drawers is adulting. 
Did you read your Bible this week? Did you spend time in prayer this week? Did you come to Tuesday night prayer? Did you tithe that first 10% of your income? Did you serve in the church on a dream team? Did you do these things because they're the grown-up things that we do? Because if you look at the whole population of our church, it's actually a smaller fraction of people that are doing the adulting stuff in the church. And it, it, you might think that that's just for certain people. To do what God's called us to do is for everybody. There's no special like gifting or calling. We all are called to serve God. We're all gifted to serve God. Our job on earth is to move the gospel forward, to move the kingdom of God forward. What did you do this week to help spread the gospel? You might go, hold on, hold on. I don't have a spiritual gift. I don't play an instrument. I don't sing. I don't do tech stuff. I don't take care of babies. I don't help in the parking lot. I don't have the spiritual gift of doing this. Because that's a, that's a really, especially with all the construction, like you need to have a really, like a master's degree in loving people enough to stand there and smile. I don't have that gift. Yes, you do. First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse four says there's many different kinds of spiritual gifts, but it's the same spirit that's the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we're all serving the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who works in all of us. Verse seven, a spiritual gift has been given to each of us so we can help each other. So unless the Bible's a liar, if you're a Christian, you have spiritual gifts. God has given you through his Holy Spirit gifts to help the body. You have spiritual gifts. Now, why did he give you these spiritual gifts? So that you can go to heaven? No, that's a done deal. That issue was dealt with 2,000 years ago. You having spiritual gifts is not for you to go to heaven. It's not so that you can defeat the devil. He's already been defeated. You have a spiritual gift so you can serve God and demonstrate the love of God to help others to grow. You have gifts. So you're like, oh, I have spiritual gifts now. I didn't know that. Thank you for that Bible verse that says I'm so gifted spiritually. Where should you be doing this serving? I probably should just serve at church once a month, right? That's what you guys do? Sure, that's a great place to start. Serve on a dream team. Yeah, once a month you should serve. But let me ask you a question. Is a doctor a doctor wherever they go? Yes. They're licensed to care for people. They've, they've taken the oath to care for people wherever they go. Is a police officer, Greg's a cop, do you have a, a, a peace officer's badge? You're probably carrying it on you. Because whether he's on duty or off duty, he is a peace officer. If a tall person, Jeff's 6'5", are you tall everywhere you go? <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? It's just who they are. Wherever you go, you are a full-time minister of the gospel. Wherever you go, you are gifted by God. In fact, what the Bible says is you're a priest. Now, I know we don't use that word in our brand of Christianity, but what it's talking about is those people that minister before the Lord professionally. And in the Old Testament, this was a very small group of people. In the Old Testament, you had to be from the, the family of Levi. You had to be a Levite. So not everybody could be a priest. Not everybody could serve in the tabernacle. And then later they built the temple. So not everybody could serve inside the big house. You had to be a Levite. But what, what Jesus was saying is, all y'all are now priests. You all serve the kingdom of God. It's, it's, it's for everybody. Peter put it this way, 1 Peter 2.5. He said, you are living stones that God is building a spiritual temple. And what's more is you're all his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer these spiritual sacrifices to please God. So adulting spiritually means you're a priest. You act in love and you serve one another. And you know what? That pleases God. Can we turn the verse upside down? If you don't serve others, you're not pleasing God. You're taking, but you're not giving. Everything you do is a part of the kingdom. And everywhere you go is kingdom work. There's no such thing as like the, the, what you do in a secular world and what you do in the churchy church world. Your job, wherever you work, wherever you go to school, that's kingdom work. You need to erase the line between the sacred and the secular. Because everything you do is kingdom work. Because he's a cop wherever he goes, he's tall wherever he goes, everywhere you go, everything you do, you are a, a, a minister, a priest of the gospel. 
So yes, you serve God in church on Sunday, but yes, you serve God at your job, at your school, wherever you go. When you go to the gym, you're a minister of the gospel. When you go to the dog park, you're a minister of the gospel. You're washing your car, you're a minister of the gospel. You have been gifted and called into ministry. The question is, we've talked about knowing, we've talked about growing, are you doing what God's asked you to do? Or are you just sitting on your own blessed assurance and hoping somebody else parks the cars in the traffic day. days? Somebody else takes care of the babies. Somebody else does the music. Somebody else does the ushering. Are you only gonna take? And we've talked about knowing and we've talked about growing. The same thing happened to the people of Israel. They're in the desert. They just come out of slavery in Egypt. We're gonna go all the way back to Deuteronomy. So this is way early. Moses gives them the 10 commandments from God. So this knowing and grow, right? We, we've knocked out know and grow, just like you guys have received. But then listen to, the very, listen to the third step that Moses gives the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 5, 32. Be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you to do. Be careful to do what the Lord has called you. Don't turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and belong and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. Did you see it? Just like Star Trek, you will live long and prosper by doing what God's called you to do. Just hold my notes for a second as I go off the rails. Back in New Mexico, uh, Pastor Swan, Pastor David Swan, we worked for their church for many years. He is our pastor. He's the father that, that we look up to spiritually and in ministry. There was a guy in the church that um, got sick. I don't remember. Let's just assume it was some form of cancer because he was only in his 40s. And they had only given him a couple weeks to live. And they had started that hospice where they're winding things down. I think we've all been there with other loved ones and grandparents and things like that and our parents. And um, Pastor Swan went in and he was like, dude, I don't understand because you tithe every Sunday and you serve. He was one of the ushers he, and he read this verse. He said, you know what the verse says? The, the Bible says that in, in the 10 commandments, if you honor your parents and then skip down, you serve the Lord, you will live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Do you believe that? And the guy's like, I absolutely do. So they prayed together. That guy's still alive today, 20 years later. Because he felt as if his, he was being robbed of living long. And so he, what he did was, every day, he would speak that verse, or those two verses. He said, Lord, I've honored my parents. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, an adult, but I've always honored my parents. And I've always served in the house of the Lord. I've always served as an usher or a greeter or various things. So I'm holding you to your word that I will live long in the land. And that dude was healed and is still alive today. Let's move on. You ever notice I was watching Elias play uh, before service with Zach, Elias is three, and then we were kicking a little ball around and just being cute, just like little three-year-olds do, right? But I've noticed that little kids tend to act like their parents. Little boys act like their dads. Little girls act like their mamas. Children of God should sound, act, and look like their father in heaven. You see what I'm saying? If we're God's kids, we should act like God wherever we go. There shouldn't be like a church version of you and then like a work version of you. Because you're a child of God wherever you go. You, you should act and look and reflect like God wherever you go. There shouldn't be like your friends, if you died in a car accident and I had to do your funeral, your friends shouldn't be like, wow, I had no idea he was a Christian. I had no idea he went to church. That's amazing. They should know that you're the Christian person at work. Like, you should almost be obnoxious about it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, not really, but it shouldn't be like some surprise. Well, if you'd have heard the way he was joking around. If you'd have heard his mouth, if you'd have heard, I had no idea. Everybody should have an idea because you should look like your father in heaven. So let me ask you again. Are you doing what God's called you to do? Are you a minister of the gospel wherever you go, whatever you do? Are you doing what he's called you to do? Are you, remember, have you been in church to know God and to grow strong? Are, are you in a new life group? Are you building community? Now, we have been on a summer break, but this week starts new life groups. So we're gonna do 13 weeks of groups, small groups during the week for the next 13 weeks. It's an opportunity for you to get plugged in and build some relationship and community. Are you doing the grown-up adulting things that God's called you to do? Are you serving on a dream team? It, 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 honest to God, I'm, I'm kidding. 
It doesn't take much to stand in the parking lot and smile at people and point them. It, anybody, this is a spiritual gift that you probably have. I, I get that you might not be able to play an instrument the way these guys do, which is amazing, but anybody can be an usher and, and take a flashlight and smile and just, you have that spiritual gift. Are you trusting God with your money? Are you tithing? That's an adulting spiritual thing to do. Are you reading your Bible because you want to, not because you feel like you have to? Are you growing in your understanding? Are you praying every day? Are you attending Tuesday night prayer? We have been doing some work on Tuesday nights. It's been really, really powerful the last few weeks. I'm proud of our people that come out on Tuesday nights. It's one hour. You're like, oh, well, I work. Dude, what do you think I do all day on a Tuesday? I, and I don't usually go home. I just stay here at the office and we'll come straight here. Hungry, tired, putting up with our church staff all, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I roll in here the same way you do. But that's an hour worth investing in our church, in our city. Because you are the light of the, wherever you go, you bring light. So you walk into a dark room, the first thing you do is flip on the light. Spiritually, you walk into a dark place, you are the light. You represent the light of the world wherever you go. There was an old guy this week um, at a grocery store, and um, he, was, he didn't have enough money to pay for his groceries. He wasn't buying like filet mignon and like a case of beer. It was like tuna fish and a loaf of bread and some rice and some, some oil or something. And it was like $30. And he was trying to get his card to work, and it wasn't working. And then he did that thing where he's like, oh. And I was able to walk up, and uh, I didn't have my personal card, because I wanted Brad and Josie to get the blessing, but it didn't. I, I guess my daughter had my card. The only card I had on me was the church card. So we all got to bless this old guy, because I just walked up. I said, hey, baby, don't worry about it. God bless you. New Life Family Church loves you. And he was like, thank you so much. That's what light does, is they love on people wherever they go. Do you prophesy to people? Do you use, we talked about having, you have the gifts of the spirit in your life. Do you prophesy over people? Do you encourage people? Do you pray for people? If somebody's sick, do you offer to pray for them? If somebody gets sick, are you the person in, in, the, in the office that they go to? Are you doing what God's called you to do? And some of these truths are for all of us. We all need to go to church. We all need to read our Bibles, right? But some of them are very specific for you. You have been saved because how much he loves you now it's time we share that because saved people serve people. Yeah. Saved people serve people. Galatians 5, you have been called to live in freedom, New Life Family Church, but don't use this freedom to satisfy your own sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom in Christ to serve one another. You're, you're born again, you raised your hand, you prayed and believed, great, get to work. Great, do some chores. You know what I'm saying? First you're gifted, and then you're called. You have a call on your life. Jesus, when he went out and he saw the 12 guys fishing, he's like, hey, follow me. I think that was a sermon we did a few months ago. And the disciples were like, okay, we'll just follow this guy. And they followed Jesus, and they did whatever he asked them to do. The same is true this morning. We're opening these scriptures, and the Lord is saying, hey, follow me. And I tell you what, neat about following Jesus and following in his footsteps and following Jesus' example He's the ultimate servant. He left heaven to come to earth to lay down his life because he loves you so much. Matthew 20 says, even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others. He gave his life as a ransom. So we're not here to be served. We're following in Jesus's footsteps. We're following in the call that he's put on our lives. We're called to lay our lives down and to serve other people. That's the call on our life. That's part of adulting spiritually. That's part of growing up and maturing spiritually is that it's not about me and my belly button and poor me and, and nobody loves me and nobody reached out to me and nobody cared about me and nobody did this for me. Instead, it's like, it's all about God. It's all about the kingdom of God. It's all about people getting saved and I wanna do my part to help out. I wanna serve other people in love. That is my mission while I'm here on the earth. Our, our job is not so we can be rich, not that we can have authority and power and influence in big houses and big cars. Our job is to advance the kingdom of God wherever we go. And in fact, we have a debt to the Lord. Now let me be very careful in this section, so listen carefully. We do not have a debt for our sin. Our, the, the debt for our sin has been paid. You can do nothing 
to make Jesus forgive any more of your sin. It has already been paid. But we have a debt of love because it was the love of God that, that, that sent Jesus to earth to pay for our sins. So because we have been recipients of this love and we have had our debt paid, we now have a debt, if you will, to pass it on to the next person. And we can't die on a cross, we can't be raised, but we can serve other people in love. Now let me make a, a point here in the middle of this side note. Don't do serving, be a servant. Because if you feel like you have to serve, you've missed the point. And then it's like on you to serve. You get to serve, you don't have to serve. And I tell you what, sometimes we serve in church and we, 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 we like beat ourselves up so we can serve more and more and more because we feel like it helps God to love us more. Nope. God loves you so much he couldn't possibly love you any more than he does right now. You serve, you don't serve. Listen to this. You're a Christian, you're not a Christian. He doesn't love you any more or any less. His love for you is always maxed out at 100%. So just because you're like, okay, I, I'm an adult spiritually, I'm gonna serve. God's gonna love me more. Nope. He can't possibly love you anymore. But he is calling you to take an active role in, in expanding the kingdom of God. He's, he's calling you, he's commanding us to do what we've been called to do. Look at it this way. If you're at work, and your boss gives you an assignment, says, I want this done by Friday at noon. We'll look over it Friday afternoon. We'll implement it next week. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I've got the marching orders. And then Friday at 11 a.m., you're like, oh, I didn't do that assignment that the boss asked for. Oh, well, no big deal. Your boss comes in. Hey, you got that? Uh, yeah, I didn't do it. What? I just didn't do it. I didn't feel like doing it. I heard what you said. I just didn't care enough to do it. Oh, you have what's called in the HR department a personnel file. And if you don't do what your boss has asked you to do, you will be written up. And depending on where you work, two write-ups, three write-ups, four write-ups, you will be fired for not doing what you have been asked to do. We get that, right? It makes sense. If you're late for work, you have to be at work at 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock, and you keep rolling in at 10, 15 minutes late. I mean, we do it for church, but you won't do it at work, right? <laughs> Because we respect our boss more than we do the king of the universe. That's good. That's good. A guy on my staff thought that was pretty good. Because <laughs> our staff's not late for work. If a teacher, a lot of you were teachers, a lot of you were in school, hey, we got to get this uh, reading report done. Read the chapters, fill out the questions, it's due, whatever. You don't, you, uh, if you're a kid like me, you just blow it off. I'm not doing the assignment. Okay, you get an 80, turn it in tomorrow. No. I'm not doing it at all. I'm just not doing it. Okay, you get a zero. And you do that for the whole semester. You fail that class. We understand that there's cause and effect. There's consequences for our actions. We, we, we get it, right? We're not freaking out. A soldier in the battlefield, some, some enlisted person, a private. Listen here, Johnson. You take this bag and you sneak around enemy lines and you go whatever to, you know, the major over there. You got it? If you don't do it, we all die. Got it. I don't feel like it. I know you gave me an order. I just don't feel like doing what you asked me to do. In a battle situation, people could die. And later, that soldier could be court-martialed, brought up on charges, put in jail for disobeying. How come we don't think it matters to the Lord if we disobey his orders in the army of God? I'm just asking. The Lord has called us. He, He's called us to do. He's called us to adult spiritually. He's called us to serve. And we're like, I don't care. I don't feel like it. And we expect there not to be any consequences. Imagine, if you will, the Great Commission. We talked about it last week. Matthew 28, 19. Go into all the world and preach the good news. And you're like, I don't care. It wasn't a suggestion. He wasn't asking for your input. It's our marching orders from our commanding officer. You're more like, hey, 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 hey. We like 2019 church. Don't talk to us that way. We can do whatever we want. That's the common church. This is an uncommon church. You want to hear how savage Jesus was? Check this out. Jesus, savage. Luke 6, 46. Why do you keep calling me Lord, 
but you don't do what I say? No, 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 put that back. That's the Bible. Who talks like that? Jesus is like, why do you call me Lord, but you don't do what I say? Shots fired at immature Christians that won't serve. What's that happen in the rest of your life? I'll tell you what it's like. If somebody, Jesus is saying, if you listen to my teaching and then you follow it, you do what I've called you to do. It's like building your house on a solid rock. You've dug down deep. You've built a strong foundation. The flood waters come, storms beat the house, but it stands firm because it was well built because you heard the gospel message and you did what God asked you to do. But verse 49, anybody who hears the word and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house with no foundation. When the flood waters sweep down against the house, it will collapse in a heap of ruins. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've called on the name of the Lord, but it's time to adult and do what he's called you to do. Ask yourself, in my house of faith, in my life of faith, in my marriage, in my children, at my work, is it built on the rock or on the sand? Because the sandy foundations are those people that don't serve that heard the word but didn't do what God's called them to do. And I'm telling you, as a pastor, I see this all the time. People think they're on the rock. They've called on the name of the Lord, but they're not coming to church regularly. They're not coming to church on time. They're not involved in attending a a, a new life group for 13 weeks. They're not serving on a dream team. They don't tithe. They don't pray. They're, They're just doing it. They're doing churchianity, not Christianity. And then something happens in their life, a storm, a sickness, they get a pink slip, they get laid off, there's trouble in the marriage, One of, there's an accident, something happens and their whole faith, their whole storm is washed away. And they're like, man, I don't know what happened, preacher. I'm like, I do, I know exactly what happened. You thought you knew better, you thought you were smarter than Jesus. Let me read it again, Luke 6, 46. Why do you keep calling me Lord, but you don't do what I say? Some of you are like, oh, fine. I'll be a parking person. Nope. You don't get to serve with that attitude. Because I'm not asking you to do something boring. I'm not asking you to do something terrible. I'm asking you to do something amazingly fun. There is such joy in doing what you've been created to do. God gifted you. God called you. And when you finally start doing what God's called you to do, it's not begrudgingly. It's not awful. It's amazing. This worship team, they practice all during the week and they get here at like seven o'clock in the morning. Nobody walks in here like, I hate this church and I hate this worship song. They come in here like, I can't believe we get to do this. I'm so excited. It's 105 degrees last Sunday. Those crazy people in the parking lot were like, woo, park this way. (laughs) They love it and they're literally cooking. I was talking to Terry Bell. She heads up our little lifers. That's our three, four, and five-year-old class. I I was walking through this morning, and she goes, Pastor Brad, I'm so excited. I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, what's up? She's like, it's Sunday. We get to take care of the babies today. (laughs) You asked me to take care of four-year-olds for two hours? I'm not going to be like, yeah. (laughs) I'm going to be like, oh, no. You guys, I, I tell you, I watch these YouTube uh, cop shows from Live PD. They, and every time they have a dog, it's just my favorite thing. Because they're like, all right, well, let's get the canine. And they go, they open the door. That dog who their whole life, from the time they were born, all of their training, they love to find dope. It's like, they're just like, Aah! So they like jump out of the truck and then like the cop's gonna hook them up and they're like leaning in for the leash. And they're like, okay, let's go. And he's running up. And then that's literally the command. The cop will go, okay, find dope. And they're like, yeah! And they circle around. And when they smell, when they get a whiff of something, and they sit down, they look at their guy like, I did it. I found dope. Because they're doing what they were created for. And there's such joy in that. The miserable people are the ones that aren't serving. Oh, snap! Singers love to sing. Dancers love to dance. Painters love to paint. Christians love to serve. That would have been, now. Uh, no, you missed it. When we serve, 
it completes us. You know, the, the movie that we don't quote from the 90s because it's naughty, but she says, you complete me. Or he says, somebody says, you complete me. Serving completes. No, grow, do. Serving completes you. I'll tell you what else serving does. It changes you. We've already talked about it. It takes you from a belly button Christian to a look at everybody I can serve Christian. And you shouldn't serve to be blessed, but serving does bless you. It blesses my socks off to get to serve. And serving makes a real difference. I tell you what, a church full of people that are serving could see thousands of people born again. All right, let me wrap this up. You've heard me say before that many hands make light work. But let me rephrase it. New life is not built on the gifts and talents of a few, but on the sacrifice of many. It's all of us working together. It's all of us serving together. And there's a reason why there's an urgency in this message. And I don't want you to be alarmed. But First Peter said, the world is coming to an end very soon. Don't be alarmed, but the end of the world is coming. Oh my gosh, what should we do? Be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. What does that mean? No, grow. Okay, now what though? The world's coming to an end. What do we do? We verse eight, most important of all, Continue to show deep love for each other because love covers a multitude of sins. Cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay because God has given each one of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. So what do you do with all those gifts? Use them well to serve one another. What does that mean in modern day? Jesus is coming soon. Look busy. Get to work. Do what he's called you to do. Use the gifts that he's, let me give you one more time. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I asked you to do? If you are a part of new life, but yet you have not taken the growth track, go ahead and put the growth track logo up back there, Josh. Next Sunday is the first Sunday in September, and it is growth track one. It's a one-hour class after church. It is literally your first step to getting plugged into our church and serving in our church. Next Sunday after church, I expect to see you in the growth track. If you're not in a New Life group, back at the back in the table and on our website, this week is launching 13 weeks of life groups. You've got to get into a life group. You've got to be part of a life group. And I tell you what, we honestly, we need more leaders in our life groups. So many of you have been called to lead but you're not leading, you're just a part. I'm glad you're a part, but you have been called to lead a life group. And let me literally explain it to you this way. I'm gonna break it down and do some math because you know how good I am at the maths. 36 people have signed up for the marriage life group. That's bigger than our church used to be. <laughs> 36 people is way too many for a group. So we really should split it, not in two, but in three. And every life group has a leader and a co-leader. So if we split that 36 people marriage group, we need two more leaders and two more co-leaders and two more homes to host that. We need you. We need you. The Pareto principle is this old leadership principle. It's a ratio. That 20% of any people group put in the effort, the money, the time to push the other 80% forward. And I hate to admit that it's true. If you think about it this way, scale that down to a church of 100 to make the numbers super easy. If you wanna have a church of 100, you've gotta have 20 leaders bought into the vision of that church, serving in the different teams, helping to lead the worship and the ushers and the kids and the whatever else you need for a church of 100. I'll tell you, we're right about 400 right now. I'd like to hit 500 by the first of the year. And we've only, I, we counted up all of our leaders that lead life groups, that lead dream teams, the co-leaders, all of our staff. We're only at about 60 leaders. So for us to win another 100 people to Jesus by the end of this year, I need 40 more leaders to buy in today. Can I tell you what I wanna do next year? Next year I wanna reach 1,000 people in Euless. I wanna see 1,000 people born again, okay? Yay! Praise hallelujah. That means I need 140 more leaders to lead life groups, to host life groups, to co-lead, to serve on a dream team, to lead a dream team. And that's, let's not be 80-20. Let's not be 
common. Let's be an uncommon church. Let's not be normal. Let's, let's see what God's really created us to do. I think we can go from good to great, but it's gonna require each of us to do our part and do what God's called us to do. Think about all, if we wanna reach that many people and we want all those people to get born again, that's like a baby Christian, right? They're just starting out next year in their faith. We have a, a preschool and a nursery, a daycare, it's Texas licensed right here on the campus. For the babies, you have to have one teacher for four babies because the smaller the baby, the more attention they need. Now we also have a preschool. So in our pre-K four class, legally, you can have one teacher for 18 little ones. So the older they get, the less care they need. The younger they are, the more help they need. The same is true spiritually. Brand new baby Christians need a lot of your help. And you might say, listen, I'm not some great Bible scholar. No, but you're further along the road than they are. You learn how to walk spiritually. Now you can teach somebody else to walk. You're like, well, I'm, I won't be good at this. We're not asking you to be good. We're not asking you to be perfect because none of us are. We all make mistakes, but we do our best to love God and to love other people and to help take people deeper in their walk with God. So come on, join the team. Take the growth track. Get on a dream team. Plug in. James wraps it up this way. He says, don't just listen to God's word. Do what it says. Otherwise, you'll be fooling yourself. You'd be like somebody that heard the word of God, you didn't obey. That's like looking at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, but then you walk away and you're like, huh, I forgot what I look like. Don't just listen to the word of God, do what it says. It's super crazy how the human body works. If you consume more calories than you burn, you will get bigger. My old wife loves when I do this. However, last month, you, you probably do notice, I've lost 10 pounds because, oh, shut up. Because, <laughs> now you clap for that, but not a great point, whatever. <laughs> last month, I worked hard. I ate a ton of salads and I did something crazy. I burned more calories than I ate. Mind blown. The same is true in the American church. We've got such great churches, such great preaching, such great books, such great podcasts. We are spiritually overfed and we're intaking more than we're giving back out. It's made us spiritually lazy. It's made us spiritually fat. Imagine what we could do for the kingdom of God if all of us began to serve, if all of us began to burn off some spiritual calories to serve. We don't just listen to God's word, we put it into action. Here's the funny thing about James. I read, I started in verse 22. Go back one verse, James 1 21. Get rid of all filth and evil in your lives. Humbly accept the word of God that's been planted in your heart. Why? Because it has the power to save your soul. He's saying, I want you to know God. I want you to grow strong and I want you to do what he's called you to do, but not until you repent of your sin. Hop up on your feet. We're going to pray. Humbly accept this gospel message. Do what God's called you to do. I'm asking you, just close your eyes. Just think about that. Do you know him? Have you called on the name of the Lord? Have you said, Lord, Lord, but I'm not doing what he's called me to do? Today's your day to respond. Today's your day to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for allowing what James said is, is evil or filthy things in my life. I believe that you are the son of God. I repent and I want to make you the Lord of my life and... I wanna start serving. I wanna start doing what you've called me to do. I believe that you've gifted me by your Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you for the, your love. Thank you for the price that you paid. Thank you that the scriptures say you came to serve us. Who are we not to serve you? Golly, the awesome price that you paid. We have a debt of love for you and for the lost and for those that are in our church that we can love and serve one another well. So Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Send me to my neighborhood and send me to the nations. Let the light and the love of God flood through me that I would be a priest, a minister of the gospel wherever we go. That we're never off duty in being a minister of the gospel, a son and daughter of the most high God. If you're here this morning and you, you hear a verse like that, and you're like, dude, there's still a lot of sin, what James called filth, in my life, in my heart, in my mind, in my internet browser, in my relationships. But today you're like, I've got to repent. I've got to get this crud out of here so that I can do verse 22, so that I can start serving. 
If you're here this morning and Jesus has not been the Lord of your life, or maybe it's been a minute, like you've, you've walked away from God and your heart has grown cold and you've allowed some filth, some sin into your life. Whether it's the first time or the first time in a long time, I'd like to pray for you. I'd, I'd like to see you repent of that sin and have Jesus wash it away so that you can start to really know and then grow and then do what God's called you to do because you have a call on your life. So if you're here this morning and it's gonna be the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, I'd like to know who I'm praying for. We'll all pray together, but I'd like to know who I'm praying for. So raise your hand up real high and say, preacher, pray for me. Today's my day. I've got to get right with God today. I see your hand in their back. Is there somebody else? I see your hand in the back. Is there somebody else? Come on, raise them up. Good. Man, I love when people give their heart to Jesus for the sake of the two and for the chickens that didn't raise their hand. If you believe it in your heart, why don't we all pray this together? Say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I repent and I turn my back away from sin and towards you. So be the king of my heart, the Lord of my life. Help me, Lord, to obey you, to do what you've called me to do, to spread your love and the power of your kingdom wherever I go. I love you, Jesus. Oh, you got quiet on that. Say that. Say, I love you, Jesus. Come on, somebody. Amen. I'm so proud of you. You, you two that raised your hand and, man, I'm so proud of you guys. Listen. Listen. 